So, um, uh, we were talking about retardation attenuation. Um, and the essence of it was exactly as shown. I scribbled down here. We've seen it before. We have this advection dispersion equation. Um, we play around with it to get a term on the right hand side which we call a retardation coefficient, which is equal to 1 plus the density of the aquifer times the distribution coefficient we defined, and the volumetric moisture content, which has an upper bound of uh, porosity. And so we end up with that on the right-hand side instead of 1. And so what we can do is we can divide both sides of the equation through by r. This then comes one again, and we end up with these effective dispersion coefficients and effective advective velocities. And so what that physically means is that these dispersion coefficients are reduced by the amount of this value r, which is always bigger than one, uh, hence it's reduced. And so in terms of what that means to how our system behaves, is that if um, we would normally expect the length of uh, travel along the core for plug flow to be equal to velocity times time, then if we divide it through by this retardation coefficient, it uh, defines how retarded it is in terms of not going quite so fast. And it also defines how it uh, is delayed in its arrival because we can just change this value to not just being length over velocity, but being length over velocity multiplied by retardation. So that defines how much later it arrives. So it's a useful concept for us to, to define. Um, the other feature that might exist, uh, which is the second of these terms, uh, is that not only is it delayed in traveling, but it might also be attenuated. So the concentration as it arrives downstream uh, might not be the same as it starts off as. And so that's physically what attenuation means. Because this retardation factor physically means that some of the dissolved material is attached onto the aquifer. And the aquifer is not moving, and it's no longer dissolved in water. And therefore, you'd expect that it would reduce the concentration. The other thing is that if we think about taking the velocity and dispersion and dividing both those terms by retardation, then when we've tried using this residence time distribution, we know that it's only good if the Peclet number is bigger than 10, right? And so uh, we need to use some other expressions to solve it rigorously if the Peclet number is smaller. So we can use the uh, solutions that we developed. If we take the velocity and divide it by retardation and dispersion and divide by retardation, then the Peclet number is divided by r and multiplied by r, so that's not changed. Uh, but if we want to get the solution for the pore volumes, the pore volumes are changed by uh, 1 over r because it only has velocity in it. It doesn't have this second term of dispersion. And so that means that uh, we change the number of pore volumes by uh, reducing them because of um, R. So to get breakthrough, we have to have more than one pore volume to, to get through, is essentially what that's saying. So um, if we know that these effects are to delay and to um, decrease the concentrations, then we might like to know exactly how we can do that for the kind of compounds we've been looking at. And we've been looking at these organic uh, fluids. And we said that we should be able to get the value of this uh, distribution coefficient directly from some tabulated values if it sorbs only onto the organic carbon. And the equations that define that relate it either to the uh, octanol water partition coefficient, which I guess is the concentration by which octanol dissolves in water, or by the solubility of that compound in water itself. So we can use two methods to do that, and we'll do that. Uh, we'll also look at what happens if we have a cocktail of things, like you do at Smithville site. 
and the effect of solubility is reduced because the compounds are all uh, fighting for uh, space within the water molecules to be held in solution. So we have to talk about Raoult's law to do that. If we know what mass, some geometries for mass removal rates, you already done one assignment where you looked at how long does it take for the stuff to dissolve out of a, a laboratory core. We can use those same kind of principles uh, in the field. And we can also calculate what mass in place is in a bit more of a sophisticated way than you've done already that it also involves this effect of retardation. So, that's what it's. so the first things are, is how, we, how do we figure out exactly what this reduction here might be and also its delay in traveling by using these tabulated values. And so it's basically uh, shown here. The idea is that um, these compounds aren't very sol soluble um, and they're not very reactive, but they are dangerous at very low concentrations, and so that's why we're worried about them. If we look at when they travel downstream, uh, we can think of two regimes that describe the behavior. And one is um, where the fraction of organic carbon in the aquifer is less than a tenth of a percent of the, uh, the mass within the aquifer. And if that's the case, then we can get the distribution coefficient just by multiplying this octanol water, organic carbon partition coefficient by the fraction of organic carbon. And so the, the basic idea is that if you assume that the only thing that's sorbing stuff in the aquifer is uh, organic carbon, then if the organic carbon content is high enough, that's probably true, because none, the, the amount that gets sorbed onto the solid quartz is negligible. And so you can use this where you have large amounts of organic carbon to calculate the distribution coefficient. And it's useful because the retardation coefficient is just 1 plus density of the aquifer over volumetric moisture content times Kd. This is the value that we want. And so if we can get that from some table, that's great. However, if the organic carbon content of the aquifer is uh, small, then if you use this obviously, and this, this content goes to zero, then it would predict also that the KD in your aquifer is zero as well. And so therefore it doesn't accommodate for the stuff that will get attached onto the um, the solid quartz, and so any approximation using this will greatly underestimate the KD, the retardation coefficient for your aquifer. So the, these two states are important. So the, f the first state is more important to us because we'll use that to be able to calculate it from these two pathways. And these two pathways are just uh, as shown here. If we want to get KD, we can get it from knowing what the organic carbon fraction is and the organic carbon partition coefficient. And we can get that through one of two ways, by linking it to the octanol water partition coefficient or the solubility of that solvent in groundwater. And so we'll just, these are taken out of Fetter. They're pretty rough figures that I have here, unlike the rest of my slides, which are, of course, perfect. Um, and just go through a, a, a couple of examples. So if you, I guess we do the, the second one first. So this comes from, so there are a bunch of these correlations. Uh, logarithm of organic carbon partition coefficient is equal to some empirical law, which relates it to some number minus 0.55 times the log of the solubility. The solubility is the solubility of that compound in uh, water. And so for this example, we take, these are not non-dimensional equations, so they have to be in specific units. And the units of solubility are mega, uh, mass per unit volume, mass of solute per unit volume of water. And so for ethyl benzene, the solubility, if you go to Feder, it's given in this table here, 
the magnitude is equal to 140 uh, milligrams per liter, which is this number here. If we want to substitute into this, you take the log of it in these units. 140 must be a log between 2 and 3, right? 1,000 would be 3, 100 would be 2. And so the logarithm of this is 2.15. You put 2.15 into here. You do the rest of the math. And you come out with the log organic carbon partition coefficient. Um, if you uh, anti-log it uh, just by 10 to the xing it, so it's something to the power 2.46, must be somewhere between 100 and 1,000, right? Between the, because of the powers. It's 288 liters per kilogram or milliliters per gram. And so that's all that's done. So immediately for any particular functional solvent for which you know the solubility and the log solubility, you can calculate what this organic carbon partition coefficient is. And if you know what this organic carbon partition coefficient is, then you can calculate, you know this, and if you know how much carbon in the aquifer is, you know this, and if you know the distribution coefficient, you know this. And if you know that, then you know everything about this system. So that's kind of where we're going. The second way to do it is to, to look at the fraction that gets dissolved in water, the organic, uh, the octanol water partition coefficient. Same deal, a bunch of correlations, again, a nasty slide, but pick your equation. There's a whole bunch of these uh, equations. Organic carbon partition coefficient is 0 0.69 times the octanol water partition coefficient. Do it for benzene. Um, log KOW is 1.92, as it turns out. Oh, sorry. So, no, that's what we're getting. Is log KOW is 2.13, which is this here. A number between uh, 100 and 1,000, right? So 10 to the power 2.13 gives you 135. Substitute 135 into this expression that we have here. This empirical expression, you get 84.98. Take the log of that. It's going to be less than 2 and more than 1, between 1 and 10. And it's 1.92, and again, in the same units as before. And so it's just a, a way of being able to get these. And if you compare it with measured values for benzene, they come out in this range. So they're just empirical correlations. People have spent bench time in a lab measuring them and correlating them to be able to figure out what they are. If you have this magnitude, then again, it allows you to get the fraction of organic carbon. If you know the fraction of organic carbon, you get KD. Get KD, you have retardation. So nothing more than that. So that is one uh, thing that we need to do. So what we could use um, is those approaches to look at, and I guess to underscore the importance of only using this if the fraction of organic carbon is large. If uh, for Borden, the aquifer we looked at before, um, where the fraction of organic carbon is much less than 0.1 of a percent, I guess a fifth of that, then if you use this approach, then for, you remember the, the case we looked at, is it here? No, I guess it's further back. We looked at carbon tetrachloride and PCE, I think, were the compounds that were used, right? So this is, experiment was done Chloride was mixed with carbon tetrachloride and PCE, uh, waited until probably 650 days later to see how far they've gone. And from each of those, from these field results, we calculated the magnitude of the retardation coefficient because that's just the ratio of the conservative solute versus the non-conservative solute, which is 57 over 23 meters, which is a, a retardation coefficient of 2.5, and we use that to calculate the K, KD value. So we could try that again but, and compare it with this estimation of incorrectly, I suppose, 
using this formula when we have a case where there isn't enough carbon in our aquifer. So for carbon tetrachloride, the solubility in water is 805 parts per million. If you take this expression and you put 805 in here, log 805, I guess, is going to be close to 3, 2.9. So you take the log of this, you substitute it, you end up with the value of the organic carbon fraction as 2.04. You tend to the exit, just a bit bigger than 100, and so it's 110 milliliters per gram. So if you take 110 milliliters a gram and you multiply it by the fraction of organic carbon, which is 0.02%, so it's uh, 100 times less than that as a decimal, so it comes out to be roughly 0.02 milliliters per gram. Um, and if you look at the calculations for the plume, I'm not sure whether we worked them through. I think we did, right? All we did was we took, perhaps we didn't go right down to the bottom. We have the value of the retardation coefficient. It was 2.48, I think. So we could use that to be able to rearrange this equation to give us the distribution coefficient in terms of um, retardation. So you take uh, 2.42 and you subtract off 1, which is this term here, r minus 1. You multiply through by the uh, porosity of the saturated aquifer and the bulk density, 2,000 kilograms per cubic meter and 0.3, I think, not sure, yeah, 0.3, 30% for here. And you end up with a value of 0.213 milliliters per gram. So that compares to the value that we calculated, which the same calculation is done here. What is it again? Before I go, 0.213. And so if we do it using this spurious method, we end up with a distribution coefficient of 10 times smaller than that. And so the reason it's 10 times smaller than that is because um, this is assuming that all of the sorption that's occurring in the aquifer is due to the carbon that's there. There's virtually no carbon in the aquifer, and therefore the distribution coefficient is going to be approach zero. And so the, the majority of the sorption that occurs actually occurs not very efficiently, but it's almost entirely on the solid grains, and therefore the estimate is off by an order of magnitude. And so if this is off by an order of magnitude, it makes a difference to this term in the retardation coefficient that allows you to calculate what that coefficient would be. And I suppose if we calculated it from this, it, oh, well, I'm not going to do the math. It, We've just done it the other way, so we don't need to do it. The point is that if you used it incorrectly, when you don't have enough organic carbon in the aquifer, you will always drastically underestimate the amount of the value of KD, and you'll drastically estimate the retardation in the aquifer because of a function of it. If you look at retardation coefficients, again, for real materials and real locations, for a variety of different sites around this country, uh, in California and overseas, from industrial sites, you see that these retardation factors, uh, which is this term here, vary between uh, ones and numbers as big as 33s. So in other words, this would go 33 times slower in the aquifer, in going downstream, than it would be if it was uh, a conservative solute like chlorine. And so you get an appreciation for these. So just have a, a ballpark number. So that it can be a big deal because it means if you believe this uh, parameterization that the residence time distribution and the time, the velocity down gradient is proportional to V over R, then it would travel 30 times less far in a given time, and it would arrive 30 times later than your predictions otherwise would be. So those seem to be important corrections to be able to add. Okay. The other thing that we might look at 
is what happens if you have multiple solutes. And you can imagine as an, in Smithville, where you have a bunch of different components, uh, the free phase solubility of different compounds in water, if you only have one compound competing to be dissolved, is different from if you have a cocktail of mixtures, which are all trying to dissolve in the water, which will dissolve at different rates. And you can get that effective solubility merely by looking at what's referred to as Rule's Law. I presume you've seen this in your uh, background. And that is that the effective solubility scales with the single phase solubility, one compound in water, what its solubility is, multiplied by the mole fraction of that compound in the system. And so if you want to do that for, say, Smithville, where the compounds that are present are TCE, TCB, and PCBs in some proportion, and some mineral oils as well. You have these compounds. They're in some proportion by weight, 2, 10, 50, and 38%. I guess they do sum to 100%. And if you know what the formula weights of these individual compounds are, then you can calculate for 100 grams of the cocktail that you have as this liquid mixture that you're going to dump in the water, then you can calculate the molar fraction just by multiplying their uh, weight percentage dividing by their, their weight percentage by the molar weight. So 2 divided by 131 grams for a mole gives you uh, 0 0.0152 moles in this 100 grams of cocktail. If you take 10% uh, or 10 grams and divide by 181, you end up with 0 .005, 0 0.055, etc. So this would be 50 over 220, etc. And so if you sum these, you get the total number of moles. So in 100 grams of this cocktail, you have 0 0.0152 molar TCE, 0 0.055 moles of TCB, etc. You have a total of 0.677 moles total. And therefore, if you look at the mole fraction, it's just the moles of TCE divided by the total moles, which is 2.2%. So basically it changes 2% to 2.2%, not very much. It changes 10% to 8%, changes 50% to 33%, a bit more substantial, and 38 to 56, just based on their molecular weights. And I suppose the most important thing is that now, since you know the mole fraction, and if you want to calculate what the effective solubility of that compound is in water when it's competing with all the other compounds, its free phase solubility multiplied by the mole fraction gives you that solubility, which is just the last column. So the solubility of TCE wouldn't be whatever its regular solubility is at 1060 milligrams per liter. It would just be 1060 times 2.3%, which is... 23 parts per million. Likewise for TCB, etc. And so these would be greatly reduced over the actual magnitudes. And so the, the basic idea is that they're competing for um, sorption sites, I guess, in water, for want of a better term. I guess it's not really sorption, but um, uh, solubility sites, I suppose, in the water molecule. And so the concentrations of these components as you go downstream, I guess, would start off looking like this. So the concentration with distance for TCE would be this. I, uh, I can't see this. I guess TC is the biggest of them. So I'm off the page, so I can't see. So they'd, they'd, they'd be differing magnitudes as they go down, down gradient. This would be the effective concentration 
of TCE. PPM. This would be the effective concentration of, I don't know, TCB, which would be 1.5 ppm. And so when they arrive downstream, they are going to be different, not because of sorption, because they started off at a lower concentration um, as they began at their source, and they'd continue, they wouldn't get any lot more concentrated than that as they go downstream, they'd get more and more dispersed. And so this would be the initial value that you'd use to calculate that behavior downstream. Okay. So uh, we know something about the fact that we can calculate the retardation values, which we said here, which says something about the form of these plots. We can calculate what the initial heights of these concentrations would be as it goes downstream from a source and arrives downstream at some kind of compliance point. And I guess the, the f final remaining thing to talk about would be the rates at which it gets removed from the subsurface. Since now we know that the solubilities would define the rates at which it's moved, removed, and you've already done some calculations in this regard. So. And we'll look at two different um, geometries, if you like. So what we've done, maybe, is we've looked at, I don't see, I don't see black on here. I guess I got rid of black. It didn't change. This is our plume that's dropped through the subsurface. I don't know if I've done this. And this is the, the trail that it's left in going down. And so you can imagine that if you have water flowing through here, this would be the water table up here, I suppose. And if you have water going through here at some advective velocity, you'd expect it to pick up material from this source. And so you could imagine that this source could be in two different geometries. One could be distributed, in which you have a block of this material that is flowing through and going from upstream to downstream, which would be this geometry here with water going through it. And the other geometry might be where you have fluid going across the top of this um, lens. And we know that if the saturation of this is close to 100% of the the, the non-wetting fluid, then no water is going to go through this, but the water is going to go around it. And if this is able to get mixed by mechanical dispersion in this zone here, you might expect that it would pick up stuff as it would go around. So these are two geometries that we might look at. So distributed and flowing through it. Um, just like in the examples you've already done, the time taken to remove that material would be the mass of the, flu the non-aqueous fluid that's in place divided by its rate of removal. And so if we calculate the mass and its rate of removal, then we can calculate how long it would take to remove it. The rate of removal would be the Darcy velocity, which is this term here. Times effective solubility times the area. That's exactly this, right? So this would be the cross-sectional area. This is the Darcy velocity. Volumetric flow rate is equal to Darcy velocity times area. 
which is equal to advective velocity times porosity times area. You know these relationships. And volumetric, uh, so the mass flux would be equal to Q times effective saturation. Right. So this times this is Q. No, sorry. Yeah. And all three of these together is equal to the mass flux. Nothing. So this is just equal to, bless you. And so if you know all of those, you can calculate how long it takes to remove it, if you are so inclined. If you come up with some numbers to put on this, if you have a cubic meter of sand, if you know what the hydraulic conductivity is, if you know what the hydraulic gradient is, one in 100, if you know a reasonable porosity, which might be 30%, you can calculate the advective or Darcy velocities just from hydraulic conductivity, porosity, and uh, hydraulic gradient. This is just Darcy's law. Velocity is equal to hydraulic conductivity dH dx. That's all this is. And it comes out to be 3 centimeters per day. And if you take the, uh, a compound and you know what the solubility of that is, if it's only a single compound, you might expect it to, to be removed at this effective solubility. If it's only a single compound, the effective solubility would be its solubility. Um, or you might reduce it. We'll talk about that later. If you used it at this exact solubility, it would, I guess, take 74.4 years to remove. If you remove it at 10% of that, this is the number that you get, which is just 10 times slower because you're removing it 10 times more slowly. So the reason for this is that you might not expect it to put up, pick up its full concentration in the time it goes from the upstream location to the downstream location as it goes across this, this plume. Right? This is a finite length. It might be a few, might be a few meters. I guess it could be tens of meters. It could be 100 meters. But it's more likely to be a relatively short distance. And if the distance is short compared to the residence time it stays in there, perhaps it doesn't have enough time to pick up its full concentration load, in which case if it goes through at some other concentrations that comes out the other side, then it, the rate at which you take to be able to remove that stuff would scale directly with that, this proportion here. And so this is why this stuff still exists in the ground at lots of these sites 10, 20, or 30 years uh, hence from it being spilled. So that's one way to, to get the, an estimate of its longevity in situ. The other one would be for the geometry where you have a lens sitting on top of a capillary barrier. And for that, we can do the same thing. Um, the time taken to remove would be equal to the mass that's present divided by the mass rate of removal, just the same as before. If we know what the mass rate of removal is, uh, what we can do is we can get a simple diffusion equation that represents this. So this is an expression that takes a, a, a hockey puck, uh, which is the shape of the lens. It's of length LP and it's of some height. Uh, it has porous medium around it, and so the water that's coming around it is doing this. And in doing this, you can imagine that at micro scale, it's going through this tortuous mechanical dispersive path. And so there's a layer at the outer region of this um, maple saturated layer, which is getting mixed somehow. And as it gets mixed, it's being able to diffuse so that if you drew a concentration profile, So this is X, and this is concentration. Then you'd expect a concentration profile to look like this, right? A diffusion profile. So the concentration of the contact would be an equilibrium concentration with the water that is present here and how much is dissolved. And 
it's trying to diffuse away from this, but it's not really diffusion. It's kind of being mixed mechanically by the tortuous flow paths of the water that's in this um, sand aquifer. And we'd expect that mechanical mixing would be the main feature. So the terms that control this, the mass rate of removal per unit area, so, So the mass transfer rate, which is surface average, so it would be mass per unit area per unit time. And the unit area would be the area of the top of this hockey puck. And so it would be four times the vertical dispersion coefficient times the advective velocity, pi, the length of the hockey puck or the diameter of the hockey puck, as it is a lens, the uh, equilibrium, uh, the concentration when it's uh, saturated in water, so this would be the solubility, and some kind of some kind of porosity, effective porosity, thirty percent. So. The concentration, again, may be the solubility of the solute in water, or it may be reduced some magnitude for the reasons that we'll talk about. And so if we know that, then from this, uh, I guess we could do uh, calculation to see that the units make sense. We've already said what the units are. A mass per unit area per unit time. So kilograms per meter squared per second, if we're working in SI. And so, again, if we want to calculate the time taken for it to be removed, we need a mass that's present in situ divided by this mass rate. This mass rate would be this term here. And the mass that's present would be this term on the top. So what would it be? It's the height of this. I guess that's incorrectly labeled. This is HP. So the height of this is HP. If you multiply the height by a porosity, that's the uh, pore space. If you multiply the porosity, so these two terms together are the volume of the voids. If you multiply the volume of the voids by the saturation of the napple, this gives you the volume of the napple. And if you multiply the volume of the napple times the density of the napple, you get the mass. But it's mass per unit, mass per meter square, per unit area, right? Because we're only including the vertical height, we're not including the horizontal area. So it's mass per unit area, we divide by a mass rate per unit area, and that gives you the time that it takes to dissolve. So all we're doing is using exactly the same expression. Time taken to remove is the mass divided by the mass rate of removal. We can choose it for where we get flow through and very intimate contact, I guess, within the pore space with the napple, which is held by surface tension, or by flowing across the top of it, where it's present as a lens. and Perhaps we want to use a correction factor to correct for the concentration that it comes out. And we've used this arbitrarily, um, but there is some reason to think that that might be important. And so these were some experiments that were conducted for an aquarium filled with uh, sand with a pool sitting on the bottom. So you flow water through the aquarium from upstream to downstream. It's a meter and a half long and a half meter wide. And you measure the concentration of the content that it comes out. So in many respects, it's a bit like this geometry here. This is the pool that's sitting in the bottom. Water is flowing over the top of it. And if it picks up its full loading, 
then you'd expect that the solubility as it comes out dissolved in water on the downstream side is equal to what the solubility is. But if you look at doing the experiment and increasing the velocity, so going from low velocity to progressively higher velocities, the concentrations, even at the lowest velocity, is only 90 milligrams per liter. And uh, what does it say what it is? It's um, the, cons the solubility is, it's TCE. Solubility is about a thousand parts per million and it comes out at 90, so it comes out at eight or nine percent of its concentration. If you can increase the velocity, uh, it comes out at even lower percentages. And so the problem with this is, or the mechanism is, that this is flowing through here. Only a portion of the fluid that's coming through here is having any intimate contact with this and being able to dissolve it. It has a finite residence time where it's in contact, and if that residence time isn't long enough for it to pick up its full load, then it comes out with still plenty of capacity to, uh, to spare. I guess if you set this to be 0.0, .0 you might expect that this would end up being uh, 100, uh, 1100 and 100% if this was 0 meters per day. And so merely as a function of that, uh, we might want to c apply a correction. So also to make the point that this correction is separate from um, Raoult's law. So this would be the maximum solubility, the maximum amount that it could put up, pick up, because it's competing with the other solutes. If this is the maximum concentration and it ends up being uh, 2%, 23 parts per million, then in going across this tank, the, the effect of mechanical dispersion and not much contact time means that it would actually come out at 2.3% uh, rather than 23, 23 milligrams. So this reduction due to its lack of contact time would be an addition or a multiplier on the, the function that we had for the uh, equilibrium concentration. So that's that. All right, um, so the final thing to talk about is to try and estimate uh, the volumes of aquifers that might be present, or if you know the volume that is presently in place in the aquifer, whether you can calculate the mass in place. And so the rationale of that is that if you find some of these sites that have been mentioned before and you look at these little ink blots which are supposed to be um, the vertical uh, plan view profiles of these plumes as they've developed in these different locations in New Jersey, uh, Mountain View is uh, Palo Alto, California, Cape Cod is, is um, I think Otis Air Force Base uh, Gloucester, Ontario. You remember we talked about a plume and whether you look at dispersion in uh, just along the length of the plume or you allow it to disperse laterally. Uh, the concentration in the center of the plume will be less if it disperses laterally. I think that was the Gloucester, Ontario uh, landfill as it went downstream. And these are merely documenting what the different contaminants were that were present in the dissolved plume. This is the picture of the dissolved plume. And what the volume of the contaminated aquifer was, is, was I guess at this time, and what that means in terms of free phase volume in number of drums that has contributed to this large volume of um, aquifer. Now, this is the, the volume in liters within the drums, and this is the volume in liters of the aquifer which is contaminated. So it's a big uh, differential. And so you could imagine that if you went into each of these aquifers and just like um, actually Borden for that matter, if you went into Borden and you could reconstruct 
the geometry of these plumes that we have here. So we have um, concentration contours. So we know the concentration here is close to zero. It's larger here, larger here, larger here, and larger here. So if you integrated this uh, mass times the volume over which it's applied, you'd come up with a potential mass of the plume. So if you took the mass as being equal to the concentration times the volume of the aquifer times the porosity, I guess, right? Volume times porosity is the volume of fluid. Volume of fluid times concentration gives you mass of fluid for these. So that would be a reasonable first estimate, but this doesn't allow us to accommodate the fact that some of the contaminant is sorbed onto the aquifer. That has to be the case because the whole reason that this uh, has not traveled as far as this one, and maybe we would expect that these peak concentrations here would actually be lower than these, is because a portion of it has been attached to the aquifer, both surrounding the plume and also, I guess, in the tail that the plume has gone through. So if we want to accommodate that, then we have to add an extra term for the sorption. And the easiest way for us to think about that is to go to this last slide, where it's all written out, and to merely document that. And so an easy way to, to do that calculation would be if we want to know exactly what's in the plume, we know that the stuff that's in the water would be the dissolved amount, but also attached to the static aquifer, there'd be an amount that's sorbed. The amount that is dissolved is equal to the volume of the aquifer times its porosity. These two together is the pore volume. This is the volume of the voids. If you multiply that volume by the concentration, that gives you the, the mass that's dissolved. But we also know that there's a certain amount of mass that's actually attached to the aquifer. <clears throat> so we take, again, the total volume of the, the plume that encompasses the aquifer. If we know the density of the aquifer in kilograms per meter cubed, and if we know the amount sorbed, the mass sorbed per unit volume uh, of that aquifer, C star, then this is the sorbed mass which is present that is immobile and is still in the aquifer, but it's not in, dissolved in the water. It's still come from the source. If we go back to our definition of sorption isotherms, the amount sorbed on the solid versus the amount in the liquid. Right? Remember we had this little diagram of taking a solute, pouring it in here, letting it equilibrate, and then measuring the concentration that we put in, in the water and the measured concentration that ends up on the solid, then doubling the concentration in the liquid that we put in and measuring its concentration on the solid, then we said that this is our sorption isotherm. And so this value here, if I look to the side, is equal to C star over C. which is the same as 1 over kd, this term exactly. So if we take this relationship, kd is equal to the solid concentration divided by the aqueous concentration, and we rearrange it. If we multiply both top and bottom by porosity divided by porosity, and then we substitute into this, then we would get k sub d c rho b times porosity over porosity. 
So now we have concentration on both sides. So if we just rearrange terms, we take the concentration outside, which is this. We take the two porosities together outside, which is this. And we realize that we also are written in terms of the, the total volume of the aquifer, which I left off here. Then we have this. And then we have a term here, which would be 1. And then we'd have this term here. So this is added. So this term here exactly is 1 plus bulk density over volumetric moisture content, or porosity, times distribution coefficient. And so, actually kind of interesting, the, the amount of mass that you have in your system isn't just the concentration on the water multiplied by this, the amount of uh, free water you have in the system, but it's the amount of free water you have in the system, which are these two terms together, multiplied by retardation, which includes the amount that's present in the water and the, the amount that's present attached to the solid. And so the sum of those two gives you the total amount that's present as spilled to be able to calculate the total mass. And I guess the final um, relevance of that would be that if you think about sucking out all the water from this um, so that it's now replenished with clean water in the area of the plume, the stuff that's present that's sorbed onto the solid is a reversible process. So if you put, instead of contaminated water in there, you put clean water, then the concentration gradient is from the solid into the liquid, and it will just sorb back. And if you have a, gra a gradient that carries it down gradient, it would just dissolve that and carry it down again to your compliance point. So it does matter what mass is sorbed onto the solid because that's not necessarily fixed there for all time. And so that's everything you finally need to know about retardation and attenuation. And so I don't usually give summaries, but summary is here. Um, we want to know exactly what it looks like down gradient and in the plume. We think that the velocity of travel and the times of arrival might be affected by retardation coefficient. Uh, we realize that we can, if we can calculate what that retardation coefficient, we can both do these simple calculations for distribution in the plume and the arrival time. And if it doesn't correspond to our Peclet number being large enough, we can also use the expressions we have to rigorously figure out exactly what it looks like in the plume and its arrival. But we need to know what the retardation coefficient is. We could get the retardation coefficient from these natural gradient partition um, tracer tests, if we're lucky. Uh, but if we have a greenfield site, we have no ability to use this, so we have to use some other way of doing that. We can get the retardation coefficient if we can get the distribution coefficient. For these organic compounds, we can get the distribution coefficient if we know the octanol water partition coefficients or solubility. It only applies if the fraction of organic carbon is greater than a tenth of a percent or one percent. You choose a number, but not very small, because otherwise it doesn't accommodate the amount that might get removed onto the quartz. Independently of that, if we have a cocktail of components in free phase, then the amount in solubilized form is going to be proportional to the molar fraction uh, that's present in the cocktail. And we can calculate what that is. And if we can calculate what the mass removal rates are and the amount of mass that's present, then we can calculate how long to remove from two different geometries that we looked at. And if we need to know that the mass in place uh, in the dissolved plume, so I guess we should make the point here that these cartoons um, are the plan view of the dissolved plume. So you can imagine that maybe you have a source up here 
which is creating this dissolved plume. Don't know exactly what these would be. But this is the dissolved plume only. If you want to know how much mass is included in the dissolved plume, you can use this expression to be able to get it. And therefore, back calculate. That's exactly what's been done here to measure the, the geometry of the dissolved plume and to figure out how much has contributed to that. And actually, it's a staggeringly small volume, if you think about it, uh, which has contributed to this uh, getting the gene. Once the genie is out of the bottle, then obviously what was quite concentrated, entropy increases and it becomes dispersed downstream. And there's some other complicated things that we don't need to talk about. And that's all we'll talk about in terms of this. So next time, we've covered uh, everything in terms of transport for conservative transport, which was part three, I guess. Uh, retard and attenuation is for non-conservative transport. So we've covered everything about that. So now what we'll talk about is what would happen if we have within the column that we have in situ. What would happen with this stuff either within the saturated zone or more likely within the Vado zone if it rains on here and this chimney is in the Vado zone what happens in terms of that being mobilized into the groundwater table so that's what we'll talk about on Thursday and then we have a week to go and then we'll talk about modeling and site investigation and then it'll be spring break that's it so that's all she wrote